you who believe Give charity For the pleasure of Allah The pleasure of Allah Oh you who believe Read the Quran Every night of Ramadan Night of Ramadan Welcome oh Ramadan It is Ramadan It is Ramadan Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic acts recommended and discouraged during the fasting. Dr. Zakia, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, Allah Barik Fi. Alhamdulillah. Masha, Alhamdulillah. This topic, again, such an important one. In fact, every 32 we will do, inshallah, will be very, very important. Inshallah. Could you, Dr. Zakia, to start the proceedings, simply tell our viewers what are the recommended acts during Ramadan? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. Awuz billahi min shaitanin rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shali sadri wa yisalli amri. Wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafqaw kawli. Normally, all the acts that are recommended during the normal days are also recommended during the month of Ramadan, except those acts which break the fast. But there are specific acts which have been recommended by a prophet, especially during the month of Ramadan, and some acts are encouraged more during the month of Ramadan. And there are many of them. Uh, I'll try and list as many as I can. The first is having suhoor. We should not neglect a suhoor. Number two is having suhoor as late as possible, just before the break of dawn. Third is having an early iftar, as early as possible, just after sunset. The fourth is having dates and water when you break the fast. Fifth is seeing the recommended du'as after you break the fast. And the sixth is that when you break the fast, it is preferable you invite other people, especially the poor people. And these six, inshallah, we'll be discussing tomorrow. The other thing which I recommend with the Prophet is, number one, that we should do as many good deeds as possible during the month of Ramadan. Number two, we should be more generous in the month of Ramadan. Number three, that if someone tries to provoke you, you should not get angry, but you should say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Number four, we should use the sevakh, that the tooth stick. Number five, that if possible, you should perform umrah during the month of Ramadan. Number six, you should try and acquire as much knowledge as possible. Read the Quran along with the translation, we have to read the hadith, read other Islamic books. Number seven, we have to attend as many Islamic programs as possible, lectures, seminars, to increase Islamic knowledge. Number eight, we should watch Islamic programs, maybe on the video, watch Islamic cassettes, hear Islamic audio tapes of scholars, so that we increase in our knowledge. Number nine, we have to be happy throughout the day. We should not look gloomy. Number 10, we should husni suluk with other people. Number 11, we should be extra good to our family. Number 12, we should do tafakkur. That means ponder and think on it. And number 13 is that we should see to it that we try and forgive people's faults. And there are other acts which the Prophet also recommended, which inshallah we'll be dealing in detail in the other days. For example, the Prophet said that we should specially be careful that all our compulsory salah we should offer in congregation as far as possible in the mosque. Number two is we should offer as much as sunnah salah, as much as nawafil. Number three, 
we should supplicate as much as possible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, we should ask for forgiveness because this is the month of forgiveness. Number five, we should recite as much Quran as possible. Number six, we should offer Taraweeh. Number seven, we should, especially in the last 10 days, we should do Qiyamullayl. Number eight is we should do Ihtikaf in the last 10 days if possible. And number nine, we should give Zakat if we have not given. Number 10 is that we should do our own self-improvement as much as possible. Number 11, seeking Laylatul Qad. Number 12 is Isra of the other Muslim brothers. And number 13 is Dawah to the non-Muslims. So these, in short, are the three topics which I have listed, which are specially recommended in the month of Ramadan. SubhanAllah. A lot of topics that we've got to get through, Dr. Zak here. And I hope and I trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can get as much benefit out to the viewers and to ourselves first and foremost as well. Inshallah. And first six topics we discussed tomorrow under the heading Suhoor and Iftar. Inshallah. So that will be very interesting. Then we've got the last 13 topics that you've enunciated. Of course they will be discussed in the coming days from the 9th until the 20th of Ramadan. And the middle topics that you've discussed, we will now take them on as importance right now. So Dr. Zakir, the first topic we need to discuss today is how can one understand generosity in terms of Ramadan? What are the acts of generosity that you would recommend a Muslim to be involved in? A person should always be generous throughout his life, but during Ramadan, he should be more generous, it should reach its peak. And there are various ways a person can be generous. For example, one thing which normally people think about generosity is helping people with money. But that is not the only act of generosity. That is one of the acts of generosity, helping someone with your money. Mm -hmm. The other act of generosity is that if you share your knowledge, or if you guide someone to Islam someone, or to Dawah to the non-Muslims, even this is generosity, you help him with your knowledge. The other act of generosity is maybe you may help them with your physical strength in doing some work, or maybe lifting something. Even that's the act of generosity. Any good deed, is an act of generosity. For example, you may be in a position. Being in that position, the job you're doing, you may be able to help someone in fulfilling his need. Even that's an act of generosity. So all these come under the acts of generosity. And the hadith of a prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Revelation, hadith number five, it is said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the most generous of all the people. And during the month of Ramadan, his generosity used to reach the peak. And Archangel Gabriel used to visit him during the month of Ramadan and used to rehearse the Quran. And it is said that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was more generous than the strong, uncontrollable wind. He was the peak of generosity. Further, beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's my hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 3233, where it is said that there will be rooms in paradise where you can see inside the room from the outside and you can see the outside from inside. And these rooms will be prepared for those people who are generous and who help the poor people, those who fast regularly and those who pray at night. So these are special rooms prepared for those people in paradise. Further, there's a hadith, Sayyid hadith, mentioned in Ibn Majah, hadith number 1746, where our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that any person who feeds the person who has fasted, he will get the reward of the person who he has fed, who has been fasting, without diminishing the reward of the person who was fasting. Therefore, it shows that we should encourage people, should feed other people. All these are acts of generosity. SubhanAllah. I hope and pray that we can be as generous as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this month. Inshallah. So Dr. Zakir, the month of forgiveness, Ramadan, is upon us and Allah has recommended us to be forgiving of one another during this month. Can you explain more about that? This is the month of forgiveness and since we ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
Allah has also recommended that we human beings, we should forgive others. And there are several verses in the Quran which have explained this in detail. If read Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse 134, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we should forgive. Allah likes those who do good deeds. That means those who forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes them. Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 199, that hold to forgiveness and enjoin what is right and go away from those who are ignorant. Furthermore, Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 22, Allah says that, and you should forgive. Wouldn't you want that Allah should forgive you? Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. Allah says in Surah Taqabun, chapter number 64, verse number 14, that amongst your wives and children, there are some who are your enemies. But it will be better if you forgive them. You overlook their fault and you cover up their fault. Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging the Muslims and the believers that it is better that you forgive as many people as possible and Allah will forgive you. And we have the best examples in the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the example in the life of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam where we know Prophet Yusuf peace be upon him that his stepbrothers they had planned against him and they wanted to kill him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves him. And later on he is made the governor of Egypt. And when finally all the brothers are at his mercy, Allah says that he said, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 92. He says that, let no reproach be cast on you, and Allah is the one to forgive. He's merciful. That means Yusuf, salam, he forgives all his brothers. And he says, Allah is merciful. We have the best example of forgiveness in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad During Fatih Mecca, when the mushriks, when the pagans of Makkah, they killed many of his relatives, that killed his uncle, that killed many of the Sabas. But when finally he had victory over them, he forgave all of them. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, that verily in the Prophet you have the most beautiful pattern of conduct. And Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 34, Allah says that repel evil with good. And you may never know, the person in whose heart is hated against you, you will find that he will become an intimate friend of yours. That means repel evil with what is good. That is the best. And Allah repeats the message in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 37. He speaks about those people, that means the people of paradise. Those are the people who avoid shameful deeds. And avoid major sins. And when they get angry, they forgive. So there are various verses in the Quran which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us guidance to the human beings that we should forgive the other people. Well, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakia, for that reminder regarding forgiving. Next question relates to anger. Dr. Zakia, regarding anger management in the month of Ramadan, people are fasting during the month of Ramadan, they're getting angry. Is there any excuse for a person getting angry in the month of Ramadan? Is it a valid excuse indeed for them to say, we are fasting, we're entitled to get angry? In fact, it is opposite. That a person, while fasting, he should not get angry. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. It says, la lakum tattakun, so that you may learn self-control. So in fact, if you're fasting, all the more reason you should not get angry. It is the opposite. It can't be a valid excuse that because I'm hungry, because I'm tired, I can get angry. It is the opposite. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1904. Our beloved Prophet said that, Fasting is a shield, and you should not speak obscenely. You should not yell at anyone else. And if someone abuses you, or someone tries to provoke you, or someone tries to make you angry, you should say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. And the same message is repeated also in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1894. My beloved prophet said 
that someone provokes you or makes you angry, say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. It's further repeated even in Sahih Muslim, several places. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, in the book of manners, hadith number 6114, our beloved Prophet said that the strong person is not one who defeats another person with his strength. The stronger person is not one who overcomes another with his strength, but the stronger person is one who, when someone makes him angry, he forgives him. He does not get angry. So actually, fasting shows us a way how to control ourselves. And as you rightly said, it's somewhat like management on how to control your anger. SubhanAllah. Well, if we can control our anger whilst we're fasting, we can do it any time, inshallah. inshallah. Dr. Zakir, regarding something which is very beloved, that is doing, performing the Umrah during the month of Ramadan, any particular advice regarding that action during Ramadan? As far as the advantage of doing Umrah in the month of Ramadan, our Prophet encouraged it. I told the Sahabas, he encouraged the Sahabas that you should do Umrah during the month of Ramadan. And our Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, word number three, in the book of Umrah, hadith number 172, the Prophet said that anyone who does Umrah in the month of Ramadan, it is equivalent to Hajj. That means if you perform Umrah in the month of Ramadan, any day of Ramadan, whether starting, middle or end, it is equivalent to performing Hajj. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, it's a very good reason, of course, to do Umrah during this blessed month. Dr. Zakir, many people have the misconception that using the siwak during the fast in Ramadan is discouraged. Could you just clarify this point, please? There are many people who think that using siwak while you're fasting is discouraged. It is based on the hadith. The same hadith I quoted earlier of Sayyid Bukhari, volume 3, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1904 and 1894. Prophet Muhammad said that by Allah, in whose hand is my soul. The breath of a person who fasts is sweeter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the scent of musk. Now, based on this, people think that if you use sewaq, the breath, the bad breath that normally comes in a person who fasts will not be there. So Allah will not enjoy the breath. And based on this, they think it is discouraged. In fact, we should realize that when a person is using the sewaq, tooth stick, it does not stop the bad breath which normally comes when a person fasts. Well, when you use the tooth stick, the sewaq, it normally massages the gums. And if there are any food particles in between the teeth, like how you use a toothbrush, it is somewhat similar to that. The bad breath of fasting comes from the stomach because no food enters the stomach. And that's how it comes. So no way does it contradict that. And furthermore, beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 887. That the beloved Prophet said that if it wasn't too difficult for my ummah, I would have made it compulsory to use the sewaq before every prayer. How wudu is compulsory? So the Prophet said, if it wouldn't have been difficult for the ummah, it would have made it compulsory to use the sewaq every time before prayer. And that means it is a recommended act. And if it wasn't good for fasting, you would have mentioned it. Like how we mentioned for excessive sniffing of water. Hadith of Abu Dawud. Point number two, hadith number 2360, where our beloved Prophet said that sniff water excessively through your nose while doing ablution, except while fasting. That means sniffing water excessively is good, but don't do it while fasting because there are dangers that will go into the throat and enter the stomach. So here too, if it was a disadvantage, the Prophet has said that I would have told my ummah to use the sevak except while fasting. So based on this, using sevak in the sunnah, it is a recommended act, it is mustahab, and you should do it, and inshallah it will get your rewards. Dr. Zakir, how can a person seek knowledge during the blessed month of Ramadan? Seeking knowledge is a very good act, especially in the month of Ramadan. There are various ways a person can seek knowledge, besides saying the Quran, which is a recommended thing during Ramadan. A person should even read the translation of the Quran. He should read the book of Hadith. And as far as possible, he should read the books which are sahih, the books of authentic hadith. The best is the Qutb al-Sitta. If you can read that, there's nothing like it. That is Bukhari, Muslim, Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Abu Dawood, 
Sunan Nisai, Ibn Majah, these Kutub Sitta are the best. If time doesn't permit, at least we should read the Sahih books of Hadith, that is the Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. If time doesn't permit, at least we should read the summarized version of Sahih Muslim or the summarized version of Sahih Bukhari or at least read the Muttafiq Alaik, the Hadith which are common between Bukhari and Muslim. He can read the book of the Seerah of the Prophet. And the best book on the Seerah of the Prophet in English language is Raik al Maktoum, the seal nectar. He speaks about the biography of the Prophet. The other book on the Seerah of the Prophet is the book on Muhammad Sallallahu by Taya al Ismail. Even that's a good book. A person can acquire knowledge by attending programs. He can go to any Islamic organization, attend lectures, attend seminars. This will increase his knowledge. He can watch video cassettes of Islamic lectures, of Islamic programs. He can hear audio cassettes. He can go on the internet, go to Islamic websites, go to authentic Islamic websites. So these are ways in which a person can acquire knowledge. And this is a good way of spending your time during the month of Ramadan, acquiring knowledge, and surely you will be benefited and you'll get a great deal of reward. Inshallah. Inshallah. All of those books, of course, you've mentioned are available in various languages around the world. So there's not really much excuse for somebody not to pick them up during the blessed month of Ramadan. So Dr. Zakir, what does the term husna suluk mean? And what does it mean to be good to your family? During the month of Ramadan, normally people have another excuse that because they're fasting, they seem to be tired, they seem to be as though they have been drawn. Prophet advised that you should look cheerful and happy. You should not look to be sad. You should be cheerful and happy. And we should especially be good to your family. And you should give more time to your family so that they get reward along with you. As far as doing Husni Suluk with the other people, this is the month where, besides the normal months, in this month you should be extra good to the people, to your neighbors, to your friends, also to your relatives, do good deeds, forgive the faults, be happy with them, be cheerful. And we should also do tafakkur, that we think and plan our day in Ramadan so that we get the maximum reward. May Allah make it easy for us to be very, very good and righteous and, and good of character and follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the best of character uh, during this blessed month of Ramadan, Dr. Zakir. Now we move on to the second part of uh, the show, which is to discuss the discouraged acts. Can you now briefly outline the discuss the discouraged acts during fasting during the month of Ramadan? The acts which are discouraged during fasting can be divided into three categories. The first is acts that are discouraged, which are contrary to the sunnah of fasting. Number two, acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan, which are otherwise also prohibited. Number three, the other acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan. Dr. Zakir, could you just mention the acts which are discouraged, uh, which are contrary to the sunnah of fasting? The acts which are discouraged and contrary to the sunnah, besides the ones we said should be recommended, I won't repeat that. It's just the opposite. It is a person should not say the niyyah aloud while fasting, the niyyah, it should not be said aloud. Number two is a person should not eat excessively during iftar or in the night. Number three, a person should not get angry. Point number four is that people read the taravi very fast. They rush through the taravi. And point number five is people socialize during aitakaf. Which of the actions discouraged in Ramadan which are also prohibited otherwise. Could you say something about those actions? The actions which are normally prohibited, and specifically during Ramadan also it's prohibited, it is backbiting and slandering, number one, one of the major sins. Number two is false speech and telling lies. Number three is verbal abuse and swearing. Number four is vulgar speech. Number five is rumor mongering and gossiping. Number six is false action. Number seven is listening to un-Islamic songs and music. Number eight is watching un-Islamic 
programs on the television and an Islamic movies. Number nine is reading an Islamic magazines and reading an Islamic books. Number 10 is going to an Islamic websites. Number 11 is wastage of food. And uh, number 12 is extravagance and being spendthrift. Dr. Zakir, how do we admonish a person who does not guard his tongue whilst fasting in the month of Ramadan? Guarding the tongue is very important because many a times, or most of the times, the tongue can cause more damage to a person than whether it be physical torture or whatever it is. You know, tongue. The person should be careful of the tongue. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, and there are various say, hadith dealing with this topic. If you read the hadith of Musannaf ibn Abi Shaiba, volume number five, in the Book of Manners, hadith number 26490, Ibn Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that by Allah, there is nothing more deserving than the extended control of the tongue. And a similar message is given in the next hadith of Musannaf ibn Abi Shaiba, volume number five, in the Book of Manners, hadith number 26491, where Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, holding his tongue, that this is the thing that has got me to this position. That means he was careful of his tongue. That is the reason he reached this position. And there are many verses in the Quran where Allah says in Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 18, that not a word that you say which is not written by a sentinel without noting it down. That means every word that you say is being written down by an angel. Further, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 53. Allah says that say to the believers that they should say things which are best. And Satan, many a time, he sows discord amongst the people, amongst the human beings. And Satan to you is an avowed enemy. So Allah says and guides us in the Quran that we be careful when you use your tongue. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Zahadith mentioned in Sai Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6484, where a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that a Muslim to another Muslim, he should not harm him by his tongue or his hands. That a Muslim is a person who does not harm the other Muslim by his hand or by his tongue. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad further said, it's mentioned in Sai Bukhari, Volume number eight, hadith number 6474, where our beloved Prophet said that anyone who can guarantee the safety, that is the chastity, of what is between the two jawbones, talking about the tongue, and what is between the two legs, talking about the private part, he will be guaranteed paradise. If the person who can guarantee the chastity, the safety of the tongue and the private part, he will be guaranteed paradise. My beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, further said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6475, that he said that he who believes in Allah and the last day, he should either speak what is good or he should keep quiet. That means when you open your tongue, speak what is good, otherwise keep quiet. And a prophet also said, as I mentioned in several hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, book of fasting, hadith number 1894, hadith number 1904, that fasting is a shield. So fasting helps you to protect and helps you in self-control, and a person should guard his tongue that is the best for him. Indeed, Dr. Zaki, it seems like these are lessons that we need to take on board all of the time, not just in Ramadan. The next important topic regards a person who commits falsehood. I want to know the, what is the ruling regarding a person who commits falsehood of the tongue whilst fasting in Ramadan? A person who says false things or lies during the month of Ramadan, as the beloved Prophet Muhammad said. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1903, that a person who does not leave his false actions and false speech, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require him to leave his food and drink. That means a person who keeps on lying and continues doing his false action and false tongue, Allah does not require him to leave his food or drink indicating that that doesn't mean the fast will break. If you fast, 
This is not one of the things that break the fast, but the reward that you'll get for fasting, it will be diminished. And if you do a sin, such as telling a lie, but natural, what reward you're going to get while fasting, it will be diminished, or maybe it will nullify. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad also said, it's mentioned in Hadith of Ibn Majah, volume number three book of fasting, Hadith number 1690, that there are many people who fast, but do not get any reward. It is as though they're fasting only for hunger. That means if you do such acts of false deeds or false action, your reward is not there, as though you're just keeping yourself hungry or starving or dieting. The main purpose that you learn self-restraint is defeated. May Allah encourage us and help us to perform righteous actions which we benefit from in this world and the hereafter, inshallah. Next question, what are the dangers of backbiting and gossip mongering during the month of Ramadan? One of the major sins in Islam, it is slandering and backbiting. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Humza, chapter number 104, verse number one, Woe to every kind of backbiter and slanderer. That you have to woe to everyone who backbites and slanders. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 12, that avoid suspicion. Because sometimes suspicion is a sin. Do not speak ill about anyone behind the back. Are you ready to eat the meat of your dead brother? And Allah continues and saying, that nay, you would abhor it. Here Allah gives the example that a person who backbites, it is as though he is eating his own brother. Now eating the meat of your own brother is haram. And further it says, eating dead meat. Eating dead meat is also haram. So if you backbite, you're committing a double sin. Not only eating the meat of your brother, eating the flesh of your dead brother. So it is a very grave sin. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, Volume number four, hadith number 6265, where Prophet ﷺ asked the sahabas that, do you know what is backbiting? They say that the messenger of Allah knows the best. So Prophet ﷺ says that if a person speaks about somebody else behind his back, which he would not have liked, that is called as backbiting. Speaking about somebody behind his back, which the person would not like is called as backbiting. So one of the Saba, he asked that, O oh Prophet, what if the thing I have spoken is the truth or the fault which I mentioned does exist in the person? So the Prophet said that if what you have spoken is the truth and the fault does exist, it is called as backbiting. Otherwise, it's called as slandering. So backbiting is a grave sin. There's another Sahih Hadith mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, Ram number three, in the Book of Manners, Hadith number 4857, where Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet, she speaks about Safiya and says that she is such a such thing, meaning she is short statured. The Prophet immediately says that what you have said, if your words were mixed in the sea, it would spoil the full sea. Further, it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number three, in the book of Manners, Hadith number 4860 where it's mentioned, Anas Milla, please with him. He says that Prophet Muhammad said, when you're taken up to heaven, that he saw some people whose nails were made of copper and they were scratching their faces and their breast. And when he asked that, who are these people? So the reply was, these are the people who backbited. Indicating that backbiting is a grave sin. And it is one of the major sins which people should abstain from. And many of us, they do it unknowingly, not realizing that it's a grave sin, we should abstain from it. And the Prophet also said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number eight, in the Book of Manners, Hadith number 6056, a rumor monger, he shall not enter paradise. So these hadiths we come to know that we have to be careful, we should guard our tongue, especially from backbiting and gossip mongering. Dr. Zaki, regarding other issues or other acts which are discouraged, which we haven't already covered. Can we now mention other acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan? The other acts which are discouraged during the month of Ramadan is that many people, they sleep the full day because they're awake in the night. 
and they only get up for the salah and they go back. They convert the day into night, night into day, which is not the purpose of fasting. Number two, many people, they are lazy and inactive during the day. Number three, many people kill their time during the daytime with things like play, game, amusement, rather than doing things which are encouraged and sunnah of the Prophet. Number four, many of them, they give iftar party rather to show off than to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five, many people, they ask the women folk in their house to cook a variety of dishes for suhoor and for iftar, thus making most of the women spend major portion of the time in the month of Ramadan in the kitchen, rather than spending time in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sixth mistake that people make is that they spend a lot of time in renovation of the house in the month of Ramadan, trying to prepare for Eid rather than worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seventh thing that discouraged is many people stay awake the full night and indulge in activities which are unproductive rather than worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number eight is that many people, they spend time in excessive socializing after Tarawih, after Qiyam layl Number nine is many people spend time in shopping. They spend most part of the night in shopping. Number 10 is that they spend excessive time in eating the full night. Number 11 is many of them, they spend the night loitering and roaming about rather than worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number 12 is that many of them, they spend the last ashra, the last 10 days preparing for Eid rather than worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these acts should be discouraged. May Allah encourage us towards spending our time productively during the month of Ramadan. Dr. Zakir, why is it encouraged to acquire religious knowledge or Islamic knowledge during the blessed month of Ramadan? As far as acquiring knowledge is concerned, the first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran, it was not to offer salah, it was not to fast, it was not to perform hajj, but it was ikra. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ikra, or Surah Alaq, chapter number 96, verse number one. Ikra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq. Khalakal insana min alaq. Verse number one and two, which means, read, recite in the name of thy Lord who has created. Who has created the human being from something which clings a leech-like substance. So the first guidance given to the humankind in the glorious Quran was to read. It doesn't only say read, it says, read in the name of thy Lord. That means reading is important, acquiring knowledge is important, but acquiring knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of our deen, is the utmost important. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mujadila, chapter number 58, verse number 11, He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised the rank of those people who believe and those who have been granted knowledge. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 269, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants wisdom to whom he pleases. And to whoever he grants wisdom, he raises them in rank. And it is for those people who understand. And the beloved Prophet, Musa he also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, one number one, hadith number 71, that the beloved Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to whoever he wants to do good, he makes them advanced in the religious knowledge. That means he gives them religious knowledge. So whoever Allah wants to do a favor on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him knowledge of the deen. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, hadith number 4005, a beloved Prophet said that the moment a person dies, after he dies, all his activities cease, except for three. Whatever good deeds he gets, he ceases after the person dies, except for three. A person who has done recurring charity, a person who has given knowledge to other people, and the person whose pious children pray for the parents after they're dead. That means after a person dies, all the good deeds cease, except for three. If a person has done some recurring charity, that Satka Ijariya has done some charity from Vox, which is keep on regularly rotating and helping people, so that's from Satka Ijariya. 
The other is the knowledge that a person gives. And after he gives the knowledge, he imparts the knowledge to somebody else, and he keeps on utilizing that knowledge of deen in helping humanity. That's Sadhke Jariya. And the last is the pious children who pray for the deceased parents. Therefore, knowledge is very important. And Allah also says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, Fas alu ahal zikri in kuntum la talamun. That if you do not know, ask the person who possesses the knowledge. Allah says, ask the knowledgeable people. So therefore, a person who has knowledge has got a high degree and has chances to pass in the examination more and he'll have a greater degree in the akhra. So that is the reason acquiring knowledge is what most important is, and especially in this month of Ramadan. If a person acquires knowledge, the chances that he acquires the knowledge is higher and he can spread it to the others. Zakhlaq Hef, the answer. Backbiting, of course, is prohibited. Irrespective whether in Ramadan or outside Ramadan. However, would a woman who complains to her husband about her mother-in-law, will she be considered as a person who has backbited? Regarding backbiting being haram and the major sin we discussed in the last episode, and there are various hadith and Quranic verses, it's one of the major sins. But as far as a wife complaining to the husband regarding the mother-in-law, but naturally she is speaking something about the mother-in-law, where the mother-in-law would not like anyone speaking about. So it does come in the category of backbiting. Is it a sin? Is a question. Such incidences where a person complains to someone and thinks and feels that once the complaint is given to the person, maybe there is a correction in action, like a wife complaining to the husband about the mother-in-law or the wife complaining to the husband about a son that he is doing so and so things which are wrong. So the husband will correct being a father of the child. Or maybe one of the two brothers is going and complaining to the father that my brother did so and so thing which is wrong. It's speaking ill about him behind. But that is so that the father can correct the brother. So these things have been permitted. Because the main reason while doing this thing should not be to mock at someone or should not be to belittle anyone. But the main purpose should be that the person who the person is complaining about, mm -hmm. there should be correction in act. And if you read the commentary of Imam al as far as the hadith of uh, Sahih Muslim, which we discussed in the last episode, hadith number 6265, in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that, do you know what is backbiting? And the Sahaba said that the messenger knows the best. So the Prophet said that if someone speaks about another person behind the back which he would not like, that's called as backbiting. And the Sahaba asked, what if I'm speaking about the person is true? The Prophet said, then it will be called as backbiting. If it's false, it will be called as slandering. So based on this, the commentary of this hadith according to Imam Nawi, he said that backbiting, gibat, in six conditions, it's permitted. Number one, he says that if something is told to a ruler of the land, or to a judge, complaining against the act of another human being who has done wrong to the person. Maybe he's stolen some wealth from you, taken your property away, or has done injustice to you. So if you go and complain to a ruler or to a judge against another human being, another Muslim, this is permitted because you want the wrong to be undone. So in such cases, Gipat is permitted. Category number two, that if you complain to someone who you feel that person has an influence on the person who has done an evil act or a sin, and you feel that he will stop doing that evil act, you're permitted. For example, if you know of a friend who's very close to the person who's done an evil act or done a sin, and if you tell him that your friend has done so and so, so and so thing, or is drinking alcohol, and you feel that he has an influence on the other person, and he can prevent him from doing the sin, it's permitted to keep up. So the question regarding the wife complaining to the husband either comes in the first category or the second category. Either it's an injustice done to the wife, or maybe the wife wants to tell the husband that you correct the mother-in-law. It may come in first two categories. The remaining four categories which Imam an nawi said Gibat can be done. The third is that if you're approaching a mufti 
or a religious person for some religious advice. So you may say that my father has done so and so act, or my wife has done so and so act, and describe the act, and ask me what should I do. Even in this case, if you avoid naming the father or the mother, or say in the third person, that my friend's father is doing so and so, it is preferable. But in such cases, while taking religious advice or a fatwa for a particular act, it's permissible. The fourth category, which Imam an Nawi says that gibbat is permitted, is that when you know of a narrator who is a liar, and if he narrates any hadith, so it becomes incumbent on you to tell the people that he's a liar, or his memory is weak because to protect the sharia. Or, for example, if someone is selling a slave, and if he knows that there are some bad habits in the slave, or maybe he does adultery, so it's compulsory that the person who's selling it should tell to the buyer that the slave has so and so false. Or if a person asks you that he wants to marry another person and asks you how is the person, so that becomes obligatory on you to tell the wrong points or the points which are not correct in that human being. Your intention here is not to belittle that human being. Your intention here is not to degrade the person, but your intention is to give the right information, whether for marriage or for business. So in these cases, this is the fourth category where Imam an nawi says that is permitted. As far as the fifth category is concerned, that if you know a person is doing a major sin openly, like he's drinking openly, or if he's cheating openly, or if he's robbing openly, so then you can tell the public at large that this person is a person who cheats, or a person who robs, or a person who discontinuously bida, or there is a religious person who you know who is doing fatwa and you know that he's not a person who's truthful. So here it's permitted that you can speak against the person. And the sixth category is that while identifying a person, if someone asks you for identification, at that time, to identify the person, you may have to use his nickname, which the person may not like. Like you may have to tell that the person who's short, person who's tall. So here you're using these nicknames to identify the person which the person may not like. Mainly for identification. Here also, if you can avoid this nickname, for identification is the best. But if you can't avoid, you can do. Imam Manavi has mentioned six categories in which gibbat is permitted. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. Next question relates to a person. Says, if a person watches TV serials or news in which women are without their hijab, will this invalidate the fast? As far as looking at a woman without hijab, staring at her, it's not permitted in Islam. Whether during Ramadan or non-Ramadan, whether fasting or not fasting. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That means the moment he looks at a woman, any unashamed thought comes in his mind. If the woman is not in hijab, he should lower his gaze. So based on this verse of the Quran, it is haram to look and stare at a woman. And when you're watching television, but natural, when the woman comes on the screen, not that you lower your gaze, most, almost all of them, they continue staring at the woman. That reminds me of an incident that once I told my friend who was staring at a girl for a long time, I said, what are you doing? It's not allowed to stay in Islam. So he told me, our beloved prophet said that the first glance is forgiven. The second is prohibited. I have not completed half my glance. <laughs> What does the Prophet mean? Did it mean that you can stare at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying that your glance is not completed? What the Prophet meant was that if you accidentally look at a woman, do not look at her again to feast on her beauty. And this is mentioned in the hadith of a beloved Prophet of Sunnah Abu Dawud, hadith number 2144, where Prophet of Sunnah tells Prophet Ali, may Allah with him, that do not look at the woman again. The first glance, it's accepted, but not look at her again. Same hadith is repeated in Sunnah Abu Dawud, hadith number 2143. The Prophet said that accidental glance is permitted, but do not look at the woman again. So based on the verse of the Quran and the hadith, but natural, watching television or watching any programs on the television or any movies in which the women aren't properly dressed, they aren't doing the hijab, and looking at them and staring at them and continuously observing them is haram.
and all the more in the month of Ramadan, it is more bad. The fast will not be invalidated, but the rewards that the person will get will surely be diminished. And if you continue, it doesn't only mean watching television, even reading magazines, even newspapers. And today, as we all know, that most of the magazines, most of the newspapers, they have photographs of ladies who are not properly dressed, obscene photographs. And that reminds me that previously, maybe 10, 15 years back, hardly any newspapers, the daily newspaper that you had, that you get in Bombay and in India, didn't contain any photographs which were obscene. But as time went on, you know, even the Indians are following the Western culture, and you find that almost all the newspapers, the daily newspapers, they have photographs of ladies who are not properly dressed. And some papers had photographs in the attached section. Now you have them in the front page also. Mm. So imagine reading these normally is wrong and Ramadan all the more is wrong. You open the paper, you're fasting, and you see a lady who's not properly dressed up or she's wearing very little clothes, you know, just to sell the paper. So all these things are prohibited normally also all the more when you're fasting. SubhanAllah. Another question from one of the viewers. A viewer wants to know, and he says, during one of the iftar parties, I attended. When a senior person entered the room, many people stood up to welcome him. Is this a permitted act? Many people say it isn't. Is it a permitted act? As far as standing up for someone to venerate him, it's not permitted in Islam. But if you stand up being the host to welcome some guest, or if you want to stand up to welcome him or shake his hand, that is good manners. To stand up while shaking somebody's hand, or if you're the host and if guests are coming, that's perfectly fine. It's a good act, it's good manners, it's a sunnah. But standing at the door, without greeting anyone, without shaking hands, just for respect, just for veneration, that's not permitted. But if you're welcoming someone, or if you're sitting in an office and someone comes, a guest comes, and you're shaking hands with thing, and then you stand up for shaking hands, it's for welcoming, it is considered as a good habit. And it's the sunnah, and there are various hadith we speak about this. For example, if you read the hadith, which is mentioned in Trimedi, hadith number 3872, it says that Prophet Muhammad he used to stand up for Fatima and Fatima used to stand up for him. It says Muhammad Sallallahu he used to stand up for his daughter. Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her. And she used to do the same for her father, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Indicating that standing up, it's not haram and it's permitted. And furthermore, there's a hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 3043, where the Sahaba stood up on the command of Prophet Muhammad when Saad ibn Maud, he came to give the judgment on Bani Qurayla. That means the Prophet said that, told the Sahaba to stand up and they stood up to welcome the other Sahaba. And further, if you read in Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 4418, it says that Tala, may Allah be pleased with him, he stood up and shook the hands of another Sahaba. Kaab ibn Malik, when he repented to Allah and Allah accepted his repentance. So here it shows that one Sahaba is standing in front of the Prophet, the Prophet was present there, to welcome the other Sahaba and he shook hands with him. So here it says that for welcoming, for greeting, for shaking hands, if you stand up, it's permitted, it's a sunnah. In fact, it's preferable, it's encouraged. But at the same time, you have various other hadith. If you read the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, hadith number 5211, where it says that when the Prophet entered leaning on a stick, the Sahaba stood up and the Prophet objected and said that, do you want to stand and give respect like the foreigners do? And another hadith says in Tirmidhi, hadith number 2754, the Sahaba never stood up for the Prophet because they knew that the Prophet did not like them standing for him. So here seeing all these various hadith you come to know that in different occasions, sometimes it's permitted, sometimes it is Mustab, sometimes it is makhru, discouraged, sometimes it's haram. And Sheikh bin Baz, 
when he was asked the fatwa, may Allah have mercy on him, Rahimullah, when he was asked the fatwa, he categorized in three different categories. He said that if a person stands up for venerating someone else who's sitting down, like the people did to the Persian king, it is haram. Because the Prophet did not like it. And the Prophet said in Hadith that when he was sitting and leading them in prayer, and the Sahaba stood up, he said that don't stand up when I'm sitting, do not venerate me like the Persians did to the king. So standing up for someone, for respect, for veneration, when he's sitting down, it is haram. The second category is when someone walks in, you stand up, but don't shake his hand, don't wish him salam. And when he sits, you sit. Or when he's leaving, even you stand up without shaking his hand, without wishing him goodbye. So this is makhru. Well, as I mentioned in several hadith that the sahabas did not stand up for the Prophet, the Prophet didn't like it. But the third category is when you stand up for greeting someone, for welcoming someone, when you shake hands with him. This is mustahab. It's encouraged. It's the sunnah of the Prophet. So standing up for shaking somebody's hand or welcoming someone and greeting him, this is mustahab, it is good manners and sunnah of the Prophet. So you can classify it under three different categories. My final question for today is regarding music. Many Muslims consider music to be allowed. Could you just confirm, did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speak against music? There is a great difference of opinion as far as the Muslims are concerned, whether music is allowed or not, whether it's permitted or not. But there is no verse in the Quran directly prohibiting music. But there are indications. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 6, it says that among them there are those people who purchase idle tales without knowledge and without meaning, and they mislead the people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they ridicule the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people who will receive a humiliating punishment. So based on this, if you say tafsir, many of the tafsir says that this idle tales without knowledge, without meaning, refers to an Islamic songs and the musical instruments, if you read the tafsir. As far as the Prophet prohibiting music, there are various say hadith. So if you read the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then there'll be no doubt whether it's permitted or prohibited. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, hadith number 5590. The Blood Prophet said that from among my followers, there will be some people who will make illicit sex, that is adultery and fornication, as well as wearing of silk, drinking intoxicants, and using musical instruments as legal. There will be among my people who will make some things which are illegal, that is adultery, fornication, wearing of silk, having intoxicants, and the playing of music instruments as legal. Now this hadith, when it says that they will make certain things legal, and we know that intoxicants is haram. We know very well that adultery, fornication is haram. Because it is mentioned along with these things which are forbidden, musical instruments are mentioned along with them, it indicates that the Prophet has prohibited them. But some people will make it legal, and we know there are some scholars who today do permit that playing of music instruments is allowed. So this hadith is very clear cut in saying that musical instruments are haram. But there are other say hadith which do permit some music instruments, especially the duff, that is the tambourine. If you read the hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad of Sahih Bukhari, volume number five, hadith number 4001, where it is said that Muhammad after consummating his marriage, he came and he sat outside, along with one of the sabas, when two small girls were playing the tambourine, that is a duff, and they were praising that sahaba, his father, how he died in jihad. And when they started praising the prophet, they said, don't praise me, you can say what you were saying earlier. Indicating that the prophet did not prohibit them from playing the tambourine. Furthermore, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 987, where the Prophet, while he was lying down, 
is hadith narrated by Hazrat Naisha. Milla, I please with her. She says that two small girls were playing the tambourine and they were singing. When Hazrat Abu Bakr, Milla, I please with him, the father of Hazrat Aisha, Milla, I please with her, he comes and he says to them, stop it. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sleeping on a cot. He tells to Hazrat Abu Bakr, Milla, I please with him, that let them do it. These are the days of Eid. He says, let them do it. Furthermore, there's a hadith in Tirmidhi, hadith number 3690, where a beloved Prophet Musa Sallam, he says that there is a person who approaches the Prophet and tells him that I had vowed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you come back victoriously, I will sing and I will play the duff. I will bang the tambourine. So the Prophet said, if you have vowed, then do it. If you have not vowed, then don't do it. So these hadith do indicate that musical instruments per se is haram, except for the dove that the tambourine, the Prophet did permit it sometimes. Dr. Zakia, thank you very much for that answer, that final answer today in this, what's been a very, very interesting and informative, as usual, session regarding the topic Ramadan, what is recommended and what is discouraged. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakia. Jazakallah khairan. Brothers and sisters, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have understood and are ready to implement all the suggestions that have been made today. I certainly must take on board some of the advices that Dr. Zakia has given today. So please do join us at the same time tomorrow when we will be discussing suhoor and iftar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حافظين ذاكرين قانتين خاشعين مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صب وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل